Welcome back, Cryptonauts, to another episode, actually the Easter episode, of Cryptocurrency Chat. Yes, it is in fact Easter Sunday, and it's after church, and if you went awesome, I, I slept through it again. There's news. <laughs> Cryptonaut John, probably no, Blockchain John, who is actually a Cryptonaut because he's the original Cryptonaut. Still not back from his vacation, but I'm sure it's well deserved. I am sure he's probably down there in, I believe it's Mexico, having a great old time with his family on Easter Sunday. I haven't heard much from him. Same for Cryptolissa. I know she's she's uh, taking a little break from the channel, but uh, I'm sure she had a great time last week. And uh, was it last week or the week before? Anyways, uh, yeah, this is Jake Jabarelli uh, hosting again the podcast. Hopefully on Wednesday we'll see John back here again. In any case, let's get on to the news and the top 10 daily stats. So, Bitcoin is kind of stagnating here. Still the first position. Uh, let me just do a quick refresh. Get the latest. There we go. 40,224.63 US dollars. A 6% decline over the last seven days. 768.8 billion dollar market cap but you can definitely tell there is a stagnation in the market it went down and it just stayed there same thing goes for ethereum at 3048.73 us dollars a 6.7 percent drop over the last week and 367.1828 billion dollar market cap not a lot of transactions going on even in the USDT or the tether number three position. There's not a lot of uh, volume. 33 billion. It's always a little bit more than the volume of Bitcoin and Ethereum because most people just transact back to t to tether. But it's a stable coin, so it doesn't move much. 82.7 billion U.S. dollars market cap. Binance is in fourth position at 413.96, three percent drop over the last week, and a 69.6 billion dollar market cap. It seems to be going up a bit. It dropped a lot, but it's come back up. Whereas everyone else is still down quite a bit. If you can see by these charts here, this is the Bitcoin chart is down. Let's see if I can make that bigger for y'all. Uh, the Bitcoin chart is still down. The Ethereum chart is still down. Of course, Ethereum doesn't really go. USDT doesn't go anywhere. But Binance bounced off the bottom here and came, came back up. USD coin in fifth position, currently slightly less than a dollar, but usually a dollar. A $50 billion market cap there, still pretty far behind the top four, but at least under $100 million, or a billion rather. A lot of activity, a lot of sales going on between USD coin and Tether and other coins on the market. XRP Ripple in sixth position, 0.769, a 0.8% gain. Wow. It's the only one in the top 10 that's done it. It is currently $37 billion even. And you can see here the chart, kind of a little low, it popped up there at the end and has been up for the last couple of days. Good for good for Ripple. We're making a comeback. Solana, currently in seventh position, 9% drop. Wow, almost double digits there. $34.2 billion. It is still it's quite a bit down there underneath XRP, about $3, $3 billion difference. Cardano is currently in eighth position, almost double digits. They're very far, very close to it. 9.8% last week, falling to 94.3 or 0.93943 US dollars. And a 30.2 billion, yet a $34 billion gap between Solana and Cardano. In ninth position, Terra at 8053, US dollars and 53 cents. Currently at 28.7 billion and a double digit loss. Oh, Terra, you're falling so far, 17.2% in the last week. And then rounding out the top 10, Avalanche, also falling nearly double digits, 8.5% to 77.39 and a market cap of almost $28 billion, exactly less than Terra at 20.7 billion. And the top, the following five, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th position. Polkadot in 11th, Dogecoin in 12th, Terra and Binance USD respectively in 13th and 14th, and Shiba Inu still making gains here in the top 15. And it's still, it's about $3 billion difference there between the 15th position, Shiba Inu, and Wrap Bitcoin. So that is the top 10. We will talk about uh, the total gains here. Not very much attained. We're still under a trillion, or probably two trillion 
US dollars in the market cap there, 1.972. Slight game in the last last day. A lot of movement there, $63 billion movement. And the market cap, or rather gain, dominance for Bitcoin is under 39% at 38.8. Ethereum is under 19% at 18.6. Dominance, and then we got to make sure we collect our candies. I'm not currently logged in, but the last time I was logged in, I think I collected number 60, which is one away from 100 because it goes 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, and then on the last day, Sunday, which would probably be a day, but it doesn't follow the perfectly by the week, uh, would be the 100. I know I have to collect the 60, but if you do collect your coin gecko candy rewards, here are all kinds of things. There's the discounts and there's books and every now and then an NFT. So make sure, oh, there it is, yep. Collect your candies to get your rewards from coin gecko. So, uh, before we get on to the news here, I'd just like to thank everybody for listening in in the beginning of the show here. We appreciate your patronage. You can also contribute to our Patreon if you like. That is a segue. <laughs> Terrible. I shouldn't admit to it. In any case, uh, you can always uh, support us by donating in Bitcoin, by, uh, Binance, Ethereum, BAT, or Raven token. Uh, you can also contribute and hang out with us on the Discord channel uh, lots of C3 media tokens to collect uh, through the very simple interface. You do exclamation point work, and every hour you can go back and collect. You, you slash work space claim to claim your tokens. And yes, they are really are paid to your Ravencoin. If you have um, a Zellcore wallet or some other Ravencoin uh, token uh, tokenized wallet, you can collect the tokens from C3 media discord every hour and then daily if you're free to do it on the hour so thank you for liking and subscribing we post every wednesday and sunday on to the news not much news on sundays and it is easter sunday so i don't really expect the news writers to write quite as much we do get our news from crypto potato as you can see here at the top and uh this little first article comes from wesley mesamore and NVIDIA RTX 3090 mod could reportedly make GPU crypto mining effort more efficient. This is good news for miners. Proof of work. PC gaming electronics researcher made headlines in the PC world this week after finding a way to boost the computational efficiency of the NVIDIA RTX 3090 card per kilowatt hour. That could save the GPU crypto mining community some coin in the electric, probably on the electric bill. In Chimin, Chiminitz, Germany, I hope I pronounced that correctly, a one-man hobbyist PC gaming researcher by the name of Igor Wadasek recently found a way to cut the power consumption of the NVIDIA RTX 3090. A report about the home lad electronics caper by Hassan Muchtaba for the WCCF Tech explains why this is a breakthrough for anyone who uses this GPU. Quote, NVIDIA's GeForce RTX 3090 Ti graphics card is without a doubt the most power-hungry graphics card ever launched, sipping over 500 watts of power and requiring insanely massive GPU cooling solution to keep the heat in check, end quote. Of course, cryptocurrency industry watchers know it's not full-time gamers who stand to save money if Igor's efficiency mod to the chip is repl replicable by others. Unless they're using the ASIC chips specifically designed to mine cryptos like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Dogecoin, Litecoin, Bitcoin Cash, Monero, Zcash, and others, GPUs remain the most effective way to mine cryptocurrency. Out of the box, the RTX 3090 has a manufacturer reference TGP or total graphics power of 450 watts. That's how much power the graphics system requires to run the chip and keep it from overheating. WCCF Tech says most custom models run at closer to 500 watts, but Eager Labs has found a, li a limit power consumption, a way to limit power consumption rather, to 300 watts and a 37% drop in TGP rating without losing nearly as much gaming performance. This was tested using 10 games at 4K resolution. That real yields an applicable amount of electricity costs for the NVIDIA GPU's computations and the insanely massive cost of cooling the RTX 3090. With electricity fed to the graphics, the entire graphics rig through a 600 watt PCIe Gen 5 16 pin connector, <laughs> which is designed to accommodate future graphics chip rated for 600 watts. Graphics processing units are optimal for solving 
SHA-256 hash algorithm problems that play a key role in the elaborate computational and economic architecture of proof-of-work cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum for the past seven years until mainnet merges with the beacon chain to create network consensus using proof of stake. While the RTX 3090 is a powerful miner with a hash rate clocked to 135 mega hash on the Dagger Hashimoto implementation of the Ethereum mining, WePC has recommended a more efficient, energy efficient rather, solution because the rig is such a power hog. Igor's modification to limit the NVIDIA's card's electricity usage could bump the RTX 3090 up the GPU mining leaderboards for key benchmark hash rate, power consumption, and daily profit per days to break even. Yeah, so basically, the best mining card that possibly exists is even better. I'm, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, it's just those cards are really expensive. Last I checked, the regular 3090, not the TI, was like $1,600 or so, and that was with a price reduction recently with the market dropping, but even more so, the cheapest I've ever seen, and I'm not talking about MSRP for the same card, because the MSRP was never that high, was like $2,250, and I'm just talking about Amazon, not eBay. So, I mean, you may be able to find it slightly cheaper from a person who's selling it used, but my goodness, that's a good chunk of change. It is the most powerful car. Personally, I'd much rather buy a bunch of, of AMD 6600 XTs. You can get like four or five of them this is the same price as a, uh, as a 3090. But I realize if it's power you're going for reduction of, it's going to get the most production out of the least power. That is a useful factor. Anyways, continuing on here with Brazil. Again from Wesley Massamore. This is an opinion editorial. Brazil's push to crypto adoption and what does it mean? This week's, let me open this up so you guys can see it bigger. This week's lawmakers in Brazil pushed to advance a bill that would legalize and regulate cryptocurrency, the National Congress of Brazil's House Bill 4401-21. Senator Araja Abreu, who sponsored a state version of the bill, Senate Bill 3825-19, dropped his version in favor of the House Bill carrying some provisions over from 4401-21. Employing some deft parliamentary maneuvering, Abreu advanced the bill through Brazil's legislative process. That's because the Chamber of Deputies, Brazil's lower house, has already approved 44021, 4401 brother, 44121. So now it only needs to make it through the federal Senate to get the full legislators sign off to become law. It's already been approved by the Brazilian Senate's Economic Affairs Committee. If passed into law, the bill would put into place a comprehensive legal and regulatory framework that would affect cryptocurrency businesses, merchants who accept cryptocurrency, investors, and crypto wallet holders who use digital currencies to make payments for goods and services. That will ostensibly hasten the crypto adoption in South America's largest country, where legislators are merely catching up to a fast-paced, growing crypto industry in Brazil. Rio de Janeiro began accepting Bitcoin for tax payments earlier this year, the first Brazilian city to do so. Many countries in Central America are also racing to, be, to welcome crypto into their economies and legal frameworks, while El Salvador is the most notable among them for President Nayib Bukele's full-throated thrust into Bitcoin as the nation's legal tender. Lawmakers and titans of the industry in Mexico, Cuba, and Honduras are hurrying to join the race as well. Increasing legal adoption and regula regulation of cryptocurrency pretends greater mass adoption sooner than would happen with crypto existing outside of the law and only in cyberspace where code is the law. That will inevitably bring with it a tsunami of capital inflows and new active monthly users who would buy and use crypto as money for payments as and financing as well. But along with mainstream cryptocurrency, faster legal regulation of the industry will also inevitably bring with it some of the problems that blockchain was invented to solve. Among these is greater control over the money system by the government and the ability of governments to use finance as a tool of control, exclusion, and even oppression as they have with fiat money issued by central banks throughout the history of regulated traditional banking. 
while institutionalized and regulated crypto companies will exist on a much wider and deeper layer of this ecosystem, there will, as a result, be new opportunities for investing con contrarians, disruptors, and risk takers in search of the ridiculous ROI like what Bitcoin has returned its early investors. They will find many of these opportunities in the DeFi blockchains and second layer infrastructure. So yes, that was the op-ed there from Wesley Mesmore. But it's good to see that there is more activity coming in with this new Senate bill and that they will hopefully be making progress soon. I, I, I hope this news is making to the ears of the legislator of the United States as well. I know we are look, the U.S. government is looking into it with the CBDC possibly, but at least it is at least making waves. I mean, it's not taking decades to get there, although it's definitely been more than a decade since Bitcoin started. But we're seeing everybody getting on board with this concept because they're seeing the validity and they're also seeing the problems. But at least it is a new system that is supported. As long as we don't go into the dark ages again, losing all internet. But if we did, what I'm doing right now would literally be impossible. You'd have to come listen to me lecture in a physical building. <laughs> which I wouldn't be against. I used to do it 10 years ago. Continuing on with Vitalik Buterin's take on the Musk Twitter takeover by Arun Srivastav. Srivastav. Besides generating a lively discussion among Twitter users around, across the globe, Elon's bid, Elon Musk's bid to acquire the social media platform for 43 billion US dollars in cash has also galvanized the blockchain billionaires club in the latest ethereum co-founder vitalik buterin has made his mind made his mind public on the issue in a tweet on saturday that would be yesterday he said he doesn't oppose elon musk running twitter but he doesn't quite approve of wealthy people or organizations taking over social media firms through hostile bids giving an example of ethically challenged foreign government doing it he said you know, he says the trend can go quote very quote, quote wrong here is his tweet i hope you have a chance to read it you can always pause the video ethereum's co-founder also said that someone with a five percent stake is ultimately weak but his ability to control policy increases by far more than 10x if his ownership reaches to 50%, hinting that the scenario can be extremely worrying. Buterin's comments are in the context of Musk's attempt to acquire Twitter and the company's board trying to ward off a hostile takeover. The ensuing tussle has taken the form of a debate about free speech and social media impartiality. To Buterin's first tweet, Binance CEO CZ replied saying, the poison pill sounds unfair. He concluded by saying, there is more than there is more than what's on the surface certainly i'm sure that is absolutely correct but it also makes you wonder why um jack dorsey left the company maybe it's time for someone else to take over the interest of the blockchain community in elon musk's takeover bid of twitter was first expressed by justin son of tron that's the tron coin who offered a 10.7% higher price at $60 per share than Elon Musk's offer of 54.2 or 5 for 20. Significantly, he said, he supports the reforms initiatives of Musk and would love to see Twitter becoming a crypto native and Web3 friendly. To add to this debate, FTX is CEO Sam Bankman fried SBF, offered to be part of Musk's Twitter if he intends to take it on-chain. He also gave an idea of what on-chain Twitter might look like and how it can be monetized to better profit. I think he's got a good idea there, honestly. Taking the idea out of a decentralized Twitter forward, uh, whether or not Elon Musk's bid is successful, Cardano founder Charles Hotkinson offered, a build, offered to build a decentralized iteration of Twitter, Hoskinson's offer to build an alternative social media a la Twitter invited all sorts of reactions from the blockchain community, with some saying it could take five years or more to come on stream. And I, I don't think it's true because there's actually quite a few companies that are already trying to do that very thing right now. 
Elon Musk's offer to acquire Twitter came in an SEC filing on April 14th. A week earlier, Musk had purchased over 70 million shares of Twitter, which led to his appointment to the board of directors that he refused to accept. Both Musk and Sun believe that Twitter's full potential is far from being tapped, and they have a vision to take this social media platform to the next level of application and profitability. I find that interesting that Justin Sun himself is trying to outbid Elon Musk on Twitter. Um, I'm going to have a, look, a little quick look at that little article here real quick. So let's see what it says. $60 per share trying to outbid. Does he have that kind of money? I mean, maybe. I don't really know. That's a that's a hefty offer there. Six dollars more. Was that what's that going to make it? I don't even know how many shares there are. All right, well, we'll come back to that. Continuing on with the news, Demons Are Sons Are Off writes: Air Europa releases the first NFT flight ticket series on Algorand. I think that's great. I like Algorand. It's a very very fast, very fast way of transferring money. One of the leading Spanish airline companies, Air Europa, partnered with blockchain entity TravelX to introduce the world's first series of non-fungible NFT airline tickets. Users who buy such collectibles will board a special flight between Madrid and Miami on November 29, 2022. A feature dubbed NFT tickets will be available for purchase on TravelX's platform. The first auction was on April 11th, as the process will repeat every two weeks. TravelX explained that the tickets will work like non traditional non fungible tokens. When traded, transactions are recorded on the blockchain. Holders can present the collectibles and receive a matching flight ticket. Air Europa and its partner said the move will grant buyers an opportunity to hold a piece of travel industry history and participate in the first ever blockchain backed flight. I hope they do this more often, honestly. I think all tickets should be on the blockchain. That's just my opinion. It will take off <laughs> from Madrid, November 29, 2022, and land in Miami. Carlos Betancourt, the artist who designed the artwork, said his initiative is an experiment with the boundaries of art and technology. Quote, the animated artwork is inspired by concepts of space, magical realms, and travel experiences, as well as by the memories and feelings these experiences evoke, he added. The non-fungible tokens are minted on Algorand's blockchain. Facundo Diaz, uh, co-founder of of Travel X praised the ecosystem for its environmentally friendly focus as it is a fully carbon neutral. Interesting. We will blend the best, this is another quote, of traditional NFTs but add real world application and experience. This provides a better flight ticket that travelers can easily manage and trade their blockchain wallet combined with a new kind of collectible art piece. We believe NFT tickets will be the perfect fusion of art, travel, and technology, the executive concluded. That's the end of the quote. Emirate also announced recently plans to join NFT and metaverse space, as Crypto Potato has previously reported. Nearly two years ago, the leading private airline, Russia S7, inked a deal with the financial institution Spurbank to employ blockchain technology and sell flight tickets for tokens the bank provided the necessary infrastructure according to estimations the endeavor handles ticket sales and cuts down on the processing time of a standard procedure from 10 days to 20 seconds that's gargantuan i can't, I can't even talk about the percentage difference there on another note venezuela's simon bolivar international airport disclosed plans to accept bitcoin as payment methods for flight tickets freddie borges uh, director of the airport argued that the mood will mood the move will attract more travelers to visit the South American country and thus boots its economy. Quote: Just as Russian passengers arrived in Margarita, they will come. They will also come to LaGuardia through uh, Conviasa. So we must advance in these new economic and technological systems that can be accessed. End quote. He stated last year. So yeah. Um, this is just the first. I wish I had a kind of comprehensive list of all the different things that we could apply blockchain to. But honestly, if you can think of something like a ticketing system, every ticketing system should use blockchain, in my opinion, for you know future tracking. And then, of course, NFT. If let's say you were one of the first people to ever travel on this kind of situation, um, you know, first NFT ticket then you could eventually regain the value of your originally purchased ticket 
and sort of pass the buck, if not make the travel free. I think that would be amazing. Just think, um, let me just give a scenario, and I'm sure, I hope, at least, I hope, some YouTuber finds this of value. Hey, YouTubers who do travel for fun, why don't you NFT every single ticket you have, and then your fans well, could effectively pay you back for your tickets, not just through YouTube. What do you think? Moving on to Germany. Dimitar Zanzaroff writes, Germany is the most crypto-friendly nation. This is a report. According to the study conducted by digital asset exchange aggregator CoinCub, Germany is the most crypto-friendly country for Q1 2022. That would be January through March of 2022. The previous leader, Singapore, holds the second position while USA took third. Oh my goodness, USA's in third for... Uh, yeah, anyways, just joking. CoinCub noted that the ranking of the top digital asset welcoming nations has changed over the past several months. Germany's acceptance of cryptocurrency and groundbreaking decision to allow crypto investments placed it in the first position of Q1 2022, the company said. An example of na the nation's recent pro-crypto direction is Sparkasis, the largest financial group in Germany. Intentions to offer digital asset opportunities to its nearly 50 million clients. That doesn't sound like very much when I think about how big YouTube is. The leader of Q4 2022, Singapore, is now second. The world's leading economy, the USA, is third. Australia and Switzerland round up the top five. Sergio uh, Hamza, Coins Concubs CEO, explained that his company seeks to give the most accurate picture of the recent crypto trends. He uses a scoring methodology to rate important categories such as fraud cases, talent, the availability of digital asset courses by leading institutions, the number of ICOs within each country. Then, quote, as events develop, we go beyond legislation and pure numbers and introduce new dimensions that are crucial for defining a country's crypto friendliness or maturity, he added, end quote. Other nations which improve their crypto friendly profile are the Netherlands, France, and Spain, CoinCub says that they have risen because they have all displayed a positive stance on the industry. In addition, there was a rise in the number of crypto transactions and creation of the blockchain startups. Switzerland also found its spot among the top 10. This was mainly fueled by the reports of its southern city, Lugano, is already accepting Bitcoin as legal tender. It's worth noting that one of the most crypto-friendly nations in Europe is Portugal, was not long not among, pardon me, one of the most friendly, but if not among, the Coin Cubs top 10 list. The government of the, of the Iberian country does not apply a tax policy on digital asset trading as it views Bitcoin and the altcoins not as assets, but as currencies. Consequently, many Ukrainian refugees flocked from their homeland to Portugal. Last year, one of the leading electricity retailers of the nation, Luz, Luz Embrace crypto, sorry, embrace Bitcoin as a payment method. While last week, the ruling body of the Portuguese island Madeira announced similar plans. So hey, Europe's getting into it too. Looks like USA, if they don't get their stablecoin on on board or their CBDC on board, they're gonna get left in the dust. Well, it's also a really big country, so I guess it's different in that sense. Good to see Germany is very crypto friendly. I appreciate that. Moving on with the news here, Jay Zung. MicroStrategy will buy more Bitcoin, Michael Saylor. In a letter addressed to MicroStrategy stockholders on Thursday, the, C the company's CEO, Michael Saylor, doubled down on his conviction of continuing its years-long Bitcoin buying spree. The paper aimed to pave the foundation for the annual meeting of stockholders scheduled on May 22, 2022. There's lots of 22s in that. The CEO promised that MicroStrategy the publicly traded company with the most number of Bitcoin holdings, would continue to buy more Bitcoin and provide software intelligent services to a wider customer base. In the letter, Saylor outlined the company's Bitcoin strategy as, quote, complementary to our analytics software and services business, end quote, a way that will enhance the growth of the enterprise customer base. In addition to strengthening its business strategy to pursue the vision of intelligence everywhere, the company considered its parallel strategy to acquire and hold Bitcoin as a great success. Saylor's strategy of acquiring Bitcoin has diversified into using the proceeds of debt and equity transactions since 2011. 
business intelligence company began accumulating Bitcoin back in August of 2020 through excess cash flow from operations. Later, the company boldened its pace of accumulation by using convertible note offerings, stock offerings, and crypto collateralized loans to purchase more Bitcoins for its treasury. Taylor also described his company as which innovation is our corporate DNA. He noted that MicroStrategy pioneered data mining software in the 1980s, was early to the web revolution in the 1990s, and espoused mobile analytics as well as cloud-based analytics in the 2000s. MicroStrategy, together with its subsidiaries, currently holds 129,218 bitcoins on its balance sheet with a total purchasing cost of $3.97 billion for an average of $30,700 per coin. It's not terrible, actually. It means they bought pretty, pretty cheaply. In a parallel at the Miami 2022 Bitcoin Conference with ARK Invest CEO Kathy Wood last Thursday, Saylor said he was, quote, more bullish than ever on bitcoin. Good place to say it, and agreed with Wood's prediction that Bitcoin could reach one million dollars per coin by 2030. Okay, so that means we've got what seven and a half years, roughly, a little bit less, a little bit more. So, Bitcoin is currently 30, what, forty thousand dollars? Let's go back to Kenny Woods up here, check it out. Bitcoin's current price 40 million, 40,000. So, a million. Versus 40,000. That is 25x from where it is now. 25 times over in the next seven and a half years. Yeah, I think it could happen. We'll just have to see. I think the, um, what was it? The, uh, not the Gemini guys, the guys that own the company that's called Gemini, the Bitcoin company, Twinklevoss. The Winklevoss twins. Yeah, they're twins, right? So Gemini, that makes sense. If it didn't already. They have said that they think Bitcoin is going to half a million dollars. And I think they said the most they thought it could go to was, I think, $2 million. So a lot of pump companies with a lot of money are betting really big. I'm not saying they're wrong. Bitcoin could definitely become more valuable. We've already hit, see it hit almost $70,000. Um, will it hit 70000 again? Yeah, I think it probably will. But... I'm not saying it's impossible for it to reach a million or even half a million for that much. I'm sure it could reach 100,000 at this point. I mean, it's not that far away. That's two and a half X what it's currently worth. But it's really just dependent upon how much of it's held. If the amount of Bitcoin that's tradable decreases, so like with Michael Saylor's company buying more and more and more of it, if they just, if they had like a million of the coins or something, um, yeah. The less it's available to trade, the more people want to trade it, the more valuable it will become. Now, the only other problem is U.S. dollar inflation is stupidly high right now, which means it makes me think that the value of Bitcoin in, quote, U.S. dollars is inaccurate. So we should stop, in my opinion, measuring U.S. dollars or measuring Bitcoin by U.S. dollars. We should be measuring Bitcoin by itself and U.S. dollars by Bitcoin. I actually kind of hope that that flips by 2030. We'll see. Continuing on with the last piece of news I have, which I thought was rather interesting, Uniswap faces lawsuits for unregistered offer and sale of digital tokens. Really? How do you sell, sue a DEX? You know, they're decentralized. How do you sue them? Well, there is still a foundation there. Jay Sung writes, Nessa Riley, an Uniswap user from North Carolina, invested $10,400 on low-cap digital tokens such as Ethereum Max, Matrix Samurai and Rocket Bunny between May and July of last year. The trader has since experienced substantial losses. That's not that surprising, I guess. And thus sought justice through legal action. On April 4th, Risley uh, launched a, the legal proceedings alleging that Uniswap has failed to conduct identity checks and impose security restrictions on fraudsters who use the platform to list scam light digital tokens for conducting rampant fraud. Two U.S. law firms have filed a lawsuit against Uniswap, suing the decentralized exchange. Like I said, it's decentralized. How do you sue that? And its backers, including famed VC firms like A16Z, or is that Andreessen Horowitz, and Paradigm for violating their securities laws by offering and selling securities in the form of digital tokens. The lawsuit filed by Kim and Sarita Suritella, LLP, and Barton, LLP, aims to 
invite victims like Risley, who have lost money on the platform since April on Uniswap, to join the class action against the founders and developers of the platform. It claimed that Uniswap has failed to disclose, quote, registration statements, end quote, including information regarding the risk of the associated investments for the securities they were selling to the users. In addition, the class action states that Uniswap Labs has allowed unlawful activities like pump and dump, quote, rug, rug pulls, pulls to occur on the platform. One of its main accusations targets DEX's free fee structure, which, according to the statement, encourages fraud by paying liquidity providers a portion of the fee for each trade. Meanwhile, Uniswap collects fees for developers and the ability to keep portion of fees for itself. The conflicting interest involved potentially put Uniswap as a silent facilitator of scams. The lawsuit above is not the first to challenge the centralized principle of DeFi protocols. In January, a gamified crypto savings protocol pooled together was legally challenged by a software engineer named Joseph Kent, who claimed the protocol's practice is essentially a form of lottery prohibited under New York law. That's not true, actually. Uh, last September, the, I mean, I'm not a judge, I realize, but I'll explain. Last September, the SEC opened an investigation against Uniswap Labs as the top U.S. securities watchdog was trying to determine how customers were utilizing the exchange, how it was marketed, and how it operated in general. Previously, the SEC chairman, Gary Gensler, outlined concerns over DeFi protocols, which he believed could be classified as types of entities the commission oversees. That's... They over. They look at them, they watch them, they're not over the seat. Okay, so the reason I say that Pool Together is not illegal is because Pool Together is basically, as far as I can tell, an identical or nearly identical copy of the thing, same thing that Yada does, Y-O-T-T-A, Yada, uh, both companies based out of New York. And the idea herein is it's basically a lossless lottery. Uh, you don't actually lose any money because you're putting in money and they make money off the interest difference. So when you make interest or you make loans on this money and then you make interest off those loans, uh, the, the interest is then turned into the prize. And that is exactly what Pool Together did. That's the reason I personally had been involved in Pool Together because it acts the same way Yada does. Now, I will say Pool Together is not a savings account the way that Yada is set up legally. Yada is a savings account. And in, I believe, May of 2020 in the United States, the uh, Schedule D rules, which limited the number of transactions on a savings account, were removed by the previous administration and because you know, of, of COVID and they wanted people to be able to get their money out more easily. Uh, at least that was the reason they gave. And so the, uh, Yada is a savings account. It just happens to have a lossless lottery tied to it. Pull Together is not a savings account, as far as I know, but it is, as far as I can tell, a lossless lottery, that being that... As I said before, uh, the prizes are paid out from the interest earned on the accounts, not from a risk or a, you, you don't have a risk to lose money on pool together because it's, uh, well, I mean, you technically do. If, you're, if pool together is done on a non-stable coin, yes, you could lose money because the stable coin value could change. But if it's done on a stable coin, you can't lose any money because stable coins don't change. So this would be the same concept as with Yada or Yada.com's version of the same concept. In any case, it sucks to get sued. It sucks to have to deal with law in that sense. Uh, prove your innocence or pay for your innocence, as it were. Uh, I, I do agree that Nessa Risley has every right to get his or her money back, but I don't agree with uh, suing a decentralized exchange. In any case, that's the news for Sunday, April 17th, otherwise known as Easter Sunday of 2022. Thank you all for watching this long. The show is not as long as the shows are, but typically on Sunday we're a bit shorter. So uh, thanks for watching. If you're on YouTube, we appreciate your likes. Uh, if you like what we saw, great. Thanks a lot. Uh, you can always just subscribe and hit the notification bell to find out when we post, which of course is Wednesday and Sunday. Uh, expect John to be back next coming Wednesday. This coming Wednesday is 420 if anyone knows what that means, I think you know. If you know, you know. And, uh, yeah, so we'll be catching you on that. You can always join us on Discord. You can you can support us on Patreon. You can support us through donating. We appreciate our, our viewers at all times and any communication you want to have with us through Discord, uh, our channel. You can always collect your tokens there. As I said before, Binance, Ethereum, BAT, um, Bitcoin, 
and Raven donations are all accepted as well as anything else on our coin tree link in the description below. So as John always likes to say when he is about to sign off from the show, stack sats and hodl. Adios.